discussing public art and we're very thrilled to have with us Elise DiMarzo, the P public art director for the city of Palo Alto and uh, the lady in charge of basically administrating a public arts program that's been evolving and expanding considerably in the last couple of years. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you very much for joining us, Elise. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and also joined by our arts and entertainment editor, Carla Kane. And uh, so um, this, this month marked actually quite a big milestone for uh, the city's public arts program um, mm -hmm. because uh, Palo Alto just adopted its new master plan, which is going to guide uh, public arts policies for the next decade. And I think a good place to start is just to kind of talk about the plan and uh, just asking Elise, um, why is this plan important and what do you hope um, the city will get out of it? Um, well, the public art master plan was a tremendous outreach effort. So first and foremost, we wanted to hear from the public. You know, what's the feedback on the existing collection? You know, where do people want to see art? What kinds of art might be appropriate? Um, where should the program go from here? As we're growing and professionalizing, we need a 10-year plan. Um, the other piece of that was that we have lots of policies and procedures that some of them have, uh, were created some time ago. And so bringing in a couple of professionals to, to look those over, make advice on what kind of changes we might need to make and things we need to incorporate into the new versions. So. Um, it was, it was an amazing experience, and so the idea is that it sets the vision for the next 10 years for public art. And you mentioned the need to get it more kind of like professionalized. Mm -hmm. How has it been functioning to this point? I mean, I, I know the city's public art program is about four decades old, right? I think 76 mm -hmm. is when it purchased its first. So, right. so, so far, has it been mostly kind of like an ad hoc basis? You would commission one piece, things like that, or was there like a plan just hasn't been as well refined as this one? Uh, I guess I'm just trying to get at how will the future practice differ from mm -hmm. uh, the ones guiding the last four decades? In the past. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. And, and it's a trend we've seen nationally that public art programs were typically managed by volunteers. So whether, you know, for here, it largely fell to a commission with a staff liaison. Mm -hmm. um, and that was pretty common practice. So um, programs are now professionalizing bringing in staff that can really manage the process. Um, the public art field has really grown and um, sort of normalized its best practices in the field. Mm -hmm. And so really being able to, to adopt those policies and those procedures and, um, and that sort of model, it was important. Mm -hmm. And Palo Alto, uh, the public art program is in a place where we're finally growing up. You know, we finally reached that point. So we're really excited about it. And how does the Art Commission um, fit in to the mm -hmm. new plan? Uh, the Public Art Commission was heavily involved in uh, the creation of the new plan. Our Vice Chair Miyagi sat on the advisory committee. So mm -hmm. our advisory committee was a group of 20 stakeholders from all across Palo Alto and different interests. And, uh, and so he was heavily involved in it. The commission uh, discussed the plan, I believe, at six different meetings, retreats, uh, various events, and, um, and really, you know, were hands-on with some of the outreach as well. Mm -hmm. So um, our hats off to the commissioners for their help in guiding this process. Um, and the commission still vets everything that's done. So um, anytime we commission a new artwork, we select an artist, um, that all goes to the commission. So everything is still done in public meetings. Everything's done out in the open. And I was very surprised and kind of impressed to learn during the council's discussion a couple of weeks ago that there's like 38 different uh, artworks in progress now just from the private developers. I think that was uh, the <laughs> number that we had a help and decided and a few mm -hmm. others. I mean, mm -hmm. that just seems like a ton. And I think that, that probably has to do uh, with the fact that the city did recently just adopt uh, uh, the, pr the percent the art from private developers. Mm -hmm. So. If you're building a new project, you will have to devote one percent of your construction costs for for artwork, which I assume just completely makes you much busier than you were before. <laughs> so I guess my question is, what what difference has that uh, policy change made to date? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that kind of the main driver for uh, this kind of explosion in new projects? Or um, well, it's interesting. You mentioned the number thirty-eight, and so it's thirty-eight projects that are subject to the ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, not all of those projects will incorporate public artwork on the site. Mm -hmm. um, any development that is subject to the ordinance, so they have to be over 10,000 square feet. It's not a small mom-and-pop shop. Um, 
they have the option to either commission art on site or pay the fees in lieu. So there are 38 projects that are subject to the ordinance. Only about half of those are planning to commission artwork on site. Um, so yes, it does keep us a lot busier. Um, many of them do hire outside um, arts administrators to help them with the process. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it definitely has increased our workload a bit. Uh, I think there's an assumption out there that there's this windfall of funding that has come. Um, by the nature of the approval process, there are quite a few projects that it takes some time for them to get through their development approvals, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't actually see the in lieu fees come in until the completion of that process when they pull a building permit. So I've sort of, of equated it to seeing lots of airplanes in the air circling, mm -hmm. but not that many have landed. <laughs> so uh, that, That's a great me metaphor for our viewers. If, if there's anything Palo Alto's love, more it's more Obama, airplanes it's, in the air. It's more airplanes in the air. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to clean them with the model jokes. That's okay, it was good. It was are good. any of those um, that are in progress, are there any that you can tell us about? Right now, that there have been um, a number of them that have come to the Public Art Commission and received their final approval. Um, so, for instance, there's one that's coming into the Stanford Research Park uh, by artist Barbara Karagoudis, and we're really excited to have her working on a piece here in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And the piece is called Frequencies, and so it's based on this idea of all the various waves um, floating through the research park and the oscilloscope, which was invented in the Stanford Research Park. Um, and the, art, the artwork reflects that, um, the sense of the waves and the movement there. And so we're really excited to see that come to fruition. So is it a sculpture? What kind of art is this? It is, is a really series of sculptures that, series? that go together. So um, they flow into the, uh, into the project. So you'll have to wait a couple years before you see it. But they are available on the Public Art uh, Commission site, so you can see the renderings there when it was approved. Oh, that's exciting. And of course, so far we've been talking about uh, private developers, but of course mm -hmm. the city's own facilities have just seen an explosion of new projects themselves <laughs> just in the last five, six years. I mean, that's right. Uh, the city rebuilt its libraries, and uh, Mitchell Parker and Kanata both have really popular art forms, <laughs> relatively yeah. speaking. I mean, people love the owls, except for a few town square readers. Uh, and uh, the, the brilliant artwork, which I recently mm -hmm. experienced in Kanata, I think is pretty phenomenal as well. And of course, anybody who goes to City Hall could see the mm -hmm. new... The, the Narduli piece of the lobby, the, yep. the digital art, mm -hmm. and and the chime, which I just learned is about to come down. It comes down tomorrow, <laughs> so if you want to play it, go tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that also seems like a, a lot of new stuff just for mm -hmm. the city facilities, but um, I was hoping you could tell me if there's anything else that we should be expecting on public sites, and including the temporary art that would potentially replace chime. <laughs> See, I love that you're anticipating what's next on King Plaza. Um, so we have dedicated King Plaza as an ongoing site for, uh, for temporary public art, so you will see a lot of it. Um, so next we have an artist named Aaron Lee Benson, who's going to create something site-specific out of wood. He creates works out of two-by-fours, um, and so it will start as a, um, a seating element on the plaza, and then this running fence that'll run between the trees and there'll be a circular element on the back end. So you'll get to see it take shape in mid-October. Um, and at the conclusion of the piece, it'll come down in about April, all of that lumber goes to Habitat for Humanity. Um, and Habitat for Humanity is in need of lumber because of all the recent fires. So, um, so it's actually, it's very timely and it's a great way to stimulate some great conversation about well, um, about a, housing in Palo Alto as well. If you build a fence, that's definitely going to stimulate the conversation <laughs> <laughs> about the presidential it's race as well, potentially. It, it is not a wall. Not a wall <laughs> fence, just to clarify. So can you tell me anything about the process that the city goes through before it selects these temporary installations? Like, mm -hmm. how did you choose Chime, or how, how are you choosing this, uh, the fence? And, uh, mm -hmm. So the temporary installations are generally a, a lower valuation. Um, these projects were selected based on an open call, and we took a number of those uh, that were suitable for King Plaza. So we had put out an open call for temporary public artwork, mm -hmm. um, but because King Plaza has certain limitations, like we can't dig anchoring systems into uh, into the deck, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are certain limitations as to what we can show there. So Aaron Lee Benson was one of those artists who proposed something that could be freestanding without requiring the anchoring, um, and it was visually compelling. We took it to the commission. They approved it. Um, so we're moving forward. Uh, we do have a current open call for artists for a pre-qualified pool 
And as part of that, we're looking for additional artists who might have um, artworks for temporary installation that might be suitable for King Plaza as well. Mm -hmm. And, and judging by the new master plan, uh, th if things go as planned, there's going to be a lot of new opportunities for temporary art. Because mm -hmm. some of the policies in the new document, and granted, they're still kind of <laughs> contingent some funding and that kind of thing. But, right. uh, but I mean, there's, there's a whole section kind of dedicated to fostering new temporary art in different mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And not just sculptures, but like things in alleyways, like new murals. Yes. Uh, so when do you expect Palo Altans to see this new renaissance of murals and little art forms <laughs> in neighborhoods. How long, how long do you expect this to kind of come to fruition? Um, or, or do you expect Well, that? Well, some of the recommendations in the plan are already underway. So, for mm -hmm. instance, one of the short-term recommendations was um, for creative seating in the downtown corridor. So you may mm -hmm. have seen uh, the upcycled propane tank benches by uh, Colin Selig. Right. There are five of them placed throughout downtown. Mm -hmm. um, another one of the recommendations, as you mentioned, was activating the alleyways. Um, we just recently received a National Endowment for the Arts Artworks grant to support uh, a project we call Code Art. And so uh, for Code Art, which we're anticipating will happen in June, um, we will commission one larger uh, new media artwork somewhere in the downtown corridor, and we're going to put out an open call to the community. So we want to tap into the brain trust that lives here, works here, plays here, teaches here, um, and come out to them and ask for ideas for how to activate those alley, alleyways for a three-day festival. So it's it's a way to turn downtown into this um, this laboratory. And is that sort of modeled after the festival where you we talked a little bit about finding Chime? Yes, the Market Street Prototyping mm -hmm. Festival, exactly. And while that has very different specific challenges, we adapted that same model for here to suit our audiences. Um, and so you know, as part of the Public Art Master Plan outreach, we just heard this groundswell of support for people wanting more temporary installations, wanting something unexpected, wanting things that are fun. We need more, um, grand, more Greg Brown murals and more <laughs> Little Owls. Although I don't think any more of those are coming. But, but murals are a big, de a big uh, subject in the plan Absolutely. as well. I, I think there was talk about like uh, six more murals or something like that, or... I might be mixing up six with a different section, but... Um, six alleyways. Six alleyways, yes. Right. Which could be murals, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, h first of all, how would you choose the location? Is there, like, a, a polling method, or is it just kind of <laughs> which which locations, like, you know, make geographic sense? Is it, like, who has a lot of art now and who doesn't? Like, how do you... Who has <laughs> a lot of walls. How do you pick who gets the next go mama? It's... <laughs> Well, it's a balancing act. A lot of, um, you know, in the plan, we did a whole mapping process where we showed where the artwork is. Mm -hmm. And council specifically asked us to show where the artwork is not yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are lots of opportunities that were called out and part of that outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so in answer to your question, in looking at downtown, there are lots of opportunities. And, you know, we will engage the commission and some of the stakeholders in do we want to continue to put so much focus downtown, or do we need to diversify a little bit um, and, and spread the love a little? So we're going to have some of those discussions at our retreat in September, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll bring that back to the uh, to our formal meeting. Um, well, it definitely, it definitely sounds like the master plan is the share the love kind of document. It's it like, is a share the love like, kind of document. Like it, it does have sections about downtown and Cal Avenue specifically for some of the more significant artworks. It does. But, uh, but it, it does seem like one of the overarching theme is reach out to neighborhoods, reach out to unexpected places. Yes. But, but I do need to ask, is there a bit of a tension between having art that you want people to see and placing art in unexpected places where people wouldn't expect to see it. Like, <laughs> if it's an alleyway that nobody visits, would you commission like, an expensive sculpture there? Like, how, do you, how do you find unexpected places? Well, of course, we want to be um, wise about how we allocate funds and that mm -hmm. it is going to get the visibility and, and would not be as susceptible to vandalism. So you certainly don't want to, as you said, commission an expensive piece in an unseen site. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, we, we try to be wise about how we allocate those funds. And I think in downtown, those alleyways, what we learned, they're very, very heavily used. So there's a lot of interest in activating those, as well as the California Avenue alleyways. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more in terms of when you once you start branching out to other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. like, like if you were to set up like a, a big sculpture in Palo Verde or yep. Palo Verde or Duvnik, wherever, mm -hmm. where you might not have as much foot traffic in commercial strips. But mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, you would, you would have opportunities, I assume, for like street art and things like that like uh sure I, i'm curious like uh what the decision making process would be i mean 
once you go outside the main commercial arteries. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, do you guys have like a process in mind for picking like, arteries? St- yeah, arteries. Oh, like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, some of those arteries were uh, were identified <laughs> capital, in the plan. So, ART. looking at, for instance, oh. like uh, like bike corridors and those mm-hmm. kind of traffic corridors. So that would be a good way to start. Um, for instance, in Midtown, the Midtown residents reached out to us a couple years ago, mm-hmm. really requesting to have artwork in Hoover Park. Um, and that began this process where we worked with them to bring about uh, the Hoover Park bears. I'm not sure if you've seen them, the mama bear, and <laughs> there are some cubs there. And, um, and the children absolutely love them. So while we would like to go out and, um, and solicit more input about where to put artwork, we would encourage anyone who really would like to have artwork in their neighborhood to contact us and reach out. And I, I do think the, the plan specifically calls out Midtown and Coverly for potential new murals. Mm-hmm. Is, is that something that's going to happen in the next couple of years, or is this more of like a long-term thing? I forgot which section it's in, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Coverly could use some love, too. So <laughs> they could definitely use So that. Coverly's definitely on our radar, and as you know, we have a um, an artist uh, studio program there that's mm-hmm. very active, and it would be great if we could have the exterior of Coverly reflect you know, all the creative people who are there as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, as we move forward in creating our two-year master plan, it'll be interesting to see where Coverly falls in there. And I do think it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that the Coverly artists could contribute to this. And, and I feel mm-hmm. like one of the, um, another theme that, that I've seen throughout the plan is kind of getting people more involved, not mm-hmm. just as appreciators or not appreciators of Right. arts, but as participants in creating it. I mean, sure. you, you talk about reaching out to like Stanford MFA students, for example, for temporary art, mm-hmm. kind of local artists. So how do you plan to go about that? Is it just more kind of like RFPs? Are there going to be more forums? Is there going to be kind of like a... How That's do you get a good people, question. How do you get people involved? Um, in, we, in you know, we do um, a lot of our, our opportunities are done through open calls. We have a uh, newsletter that we put out. We post all of our opportunities on that. So we try mm-hmm. and broadcast it and on social media. Um, we'd love your help in getting the word out on those mm-hmm. things. So, um, so if Carla really wants to paint a mural, <laughs> but she would have to qualify as an artist. We do have definitions. I haven't seen your portfolio Check. yet, but you know we can talk. <laughs> okay. Great. And an- another area that uh, felt really new to me is this whole idea of a specific plan for specific areas of art. Yes. Like for example, coming up with an art plan just for Cal Avenue or an art plan mm-hmm. just for university. So for example, if a developer is building a project. And Rather than building something on site, they contribute mm-hmm. money so the city could kind of spruce up its art district. Do, mm-hmm. do you see that uh, advancing much further? Because I know it's just a concept, but uh, mm-hmm. this seems kind of like a, a new vision. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'd be curious to learn, first of all, how did you guys come up with this idea and mm-hmm. whether you see it uh, as advancing anytime in the next few years? Um, I do see it advancing. Um, it was an idea that was presented by our public art consultants mm-hmm. um, as we started looking at where the upcoming private development projects are and that there are certainly clusters um, and there are certain corridors there that may have different um, different needs or concerns. I'd say Cal so, Avenue. I mean, so it's already for, been kind of known as an arts district, right? It is an arts district, um, but we've heard a lot of feedback for people wanting more art and wanting temporary art through Cal Ave. So, um, so it would be great to bring someone in to really engage that specific audience and perhaps call out opportunities for rotating temporary art um, or temporarily placed murals that change every couple of years. It could be done with a vinyl. Same with downtown, same with you know midtown. Um, but that's, that's drilling down to a level of detail that this plan couldn't quite get into. Yeah, I just feel like in Palo Alto there's quite a few, quite a few plans and sometimes it take a long time to put together. And I feel like you, you, you guys have gone pretty quick on this compared to some of the other plans, like the comprehensive plan, for example. Uh, that's a compliment. I'm not knocking your outreach or anything. No, I appreciate but, but, that. But, 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 but I also like um, kind of appreciate the fact that if you were to go for specific plans, that would mm-hmm. also probably be kind of a long, intense process. So um, it just seems like that would create some challenges. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious whether that's something you guys considered. The fact that if you go down that path, it might be many years before... You know, actually, um, in in the outreach process for this, we got a lot of great connections. So I, I'm more of a mindset that we ought to ride that momentum, those connections, people feeling invested and really who are engaged in that dialogue of public art. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to think about, okay, prioritizing which of these areas do we want to start with and move forward with those. Mm-hmm. So um, again, those are discussions we'll have with the commission as we prioritize the next two years. 
Well, I wanted to ask you, go, <laughs> going slightly a different, uh, going off the policy wonk path, there's a few works of art that people are constantly talking about because sure. they're in such visible locations. You got digital DNA. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've mentioned the Go Mama yet in uh, this webcast. <laughs> Wait, which one was that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, the Confluence Fountain in the station because it's a sure. place. But I'm aware there's also dozens of artwork and slightly kind of off the beaten path, whether in the Baylands or elsewhere. I wanted to ask if you have any favorites and whether there's any <laughs> pieces of art that you think aren't getting seen by many people because of their locations that you would like to bring our attention to. Hidden gems. Yeah. That is tough. Hidden, and it's so hard for me to, to, to pick favorites. That's not fair. Um, That's why it's a good question. <laughs> well, I have favorites for different reasons. So um, the Brilliance series of sculptures at Rinconada Park and favorite. the Art Center um, is a favorite for multiple reasons. It was a tremendous outreach effort. We engaged groups of, of people who... You know, when we first approached them to, to submit quotes about growth um, in various languages that reflect the cultural makeup of Palo Alto, the first response from a lot of them was, well, I don't know anything about public art. And, um, and it was a great experience bringing them in and saying, no, we want to hear some of your inspiring quotes about growth, whether it's biological growth, spiritual growth, artistic growth. Um, and they were incorporated into these sculptures. And to ultimately see them installed and late at night. Um, They're a beautiful the, site late at night, by the way. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I told you about this before our webcast. <laughs> that's actually one of my favorites, which I experienced fairly recently. Not just mm-hmm. because it looks nice, but because it has all these aph- if aphorisms that you could memorize and you could sound smart for weeks. Do you have a favorite? Oh, I have a whole list of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the, the Morse code. <laughs> you have, you have like, well, you have some of the, what you would expect. Like and the Steve Jobs. you can change stay, the color. Stay hungry, you know, stay no. foolish. Yeah, and now I know you could, you could change. You can it's change the colors of them. So... Yeah. You can yeah, have fun lots with of that. Favorites. Mm-hmm. Growth is a process of creative destruction, which is the one I think about when I look at Gomama. <laughs> <laughs> to grow, sometimes we need to. Creative? Carla's <laughs> oh, shaking her head. Failures are stepping stones to success. <laughs> I also think about that in that. In that. <laughs> yeah, there's many good ones, and they're different languages. You know, yes. Some are, some are yes. written in Mandarin, some in German, Morse code. So anyway. Aside from brilliance, any others? That <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it, it, there the aren't projects, favorites, but just some that are kind of less well-known. So a lot of people who go to Mitchell Park um, may not realize that the large wooden piece um, is actually a piece of public art. They think, oh, it's just, you know, it's a play structure or something like that because it mm-hmm. is adjacent to a playground. Um, but Johnson's driftwood piece after the fire, which should be on our it handy is. dandy map, which is, is on our website. Um and it and PUSH, as I understand it, were part of a temporary placement, and then later um, the commission decided to purchase them and place them there. So they've been there a very long time. Um, people love them, but not everyone realizes that that's actually a piece in our collection. It's pretty amazing the variety of different art styles around Mitchell Park. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, it's a fairly large park, but it's still just like kind of one area of the city. And, it you, is. and you see, like, the, the Beasley looks nothing like the Whimsy and Wise Owls, and mm-hmm. which look nothing like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, after the fire. Well, when we created the um, the master plan for the Mitchell Park Library and Community Center for the public art there, we were very aware and working with so many stakeholders about the various audiences that we needed to um, to really draw in and address. And it's everyone from children coming to classes to people who wanted more um, sort of in- intellectual stimulation to the mural in the teen room that they could change. So... Um, so it, it was an exciting process, and we're really pleased with the way that turned out. Yeah, I think it's not a coincidence that you have such a great variety of d- different <laughs> styles and things. And how does the um, public art at the Art Center mm-hmm. play into the public art program, or is it completely separate? Uh, the Art Center is a separate program from the public art program. Uh, they have their own exhibitions and whatnot. The public art program does have a number of pieces around the Art Center, Um, So the pieces in the courtyard there, um, and one of my favorites, Homage to Silence by Jerome Kirk, which used to be the symbol of what was then called the Cultural Center. Um, Mm -hmm. It's on the Newell side, the red kinetic sculpture, um, another favorite. Um, But the Art Center and the Public Art Program are partnering to bring um, Patrick Dougherty back to do a new piece, (laughs) but this time it's going to be along Embarcadero Road. 
So we're all really excited about that. And of course, we, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration between those two programs. So we work with them very closely. Yeah. And, and you mentioned public art program becoming kind of more professionalized and expanding greatly because of the, the changes in policy. Yes. I, I remember things were a little different six years ago when there was public art was a at the center of a very democratic exercise, which <laughs> not, not, not paid professional staff. There were a few, but it was mostly residents coming out and voting for what kind of fountain they would want. Mm -hmm. It was uh, choosing art by not even a committee, like harnessing the wisdom of crowds. Uh, and it ended up being like a pretty contentious kind of choice. Uh, yes. there, were, there were three finalists, and you guys went with a modernist structure called Confluence. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, do you see that kind of process reemerging anytime in the future? The idea of residents voting and this well, kind of... It's advisory, though. It's, uh... <laughs> it was advisory, but still, it, it got a lot of people involved, I feel like. I feel like everybody was talking public oh, yeah. art. Not everybody mm -hmm. was happy, but everybody was aware. Right, and I and I think it, it was a, a good... Um, it was a good exercise. You know, the, the intent was to really engage people and gather input. So using Open City Hall the same way that uh, the council does. So as an advisory way to, to sort of take the pulse of what people thought. Um, and of the three proposals, it was evident that two emerged as the favorites and one sort of fell out. And so between those two, the commission read the comments and really looked into the details. And those two, it was a difference of... It was a really small percentage. It was something along the lines of 10 people preferred mm -hmm. one over the other. Um, but yes, it, it was a contentious process because people took it as a vote rather than, um, than that they were giving Advisor. input. Um, and so I think the lesson learned there is that as soon as someone's asked to choose a favorite, that they feel like it's a vote. And so that, that was definitely, um, you know, it was a learning curve. And that was unfortunate. But mm -hmm. I think... Uh, at the end of the day, the commission chose an artist who's from Palo Alto, Mike Sabo, um, who was very, very aware of all the issues and the concerns of the community. And I think what we wound up with was a beautiful piece. So. Yeah, and it's always a good symbol of the whole Cal Avenue kind of re <laughs> right. renaissance at large because I feel like it's something that was really contentious when it was happening. Mm -hmm. But after it happened, you don't hear any complaints really, or very few complaints. The, so what we've heard like back has been really happy. great, yes. Well, um, I, th I think that's pretty much the questions I have, unless Carla. Or, or, um, I did wonder, this question for you, sure. and you, is uh, <laughs> if you have a sense of how Palo Alto's public art program and commission and everything compares to some other local cities, if it's similar or if there are a lot of differences. Oh, yeah, because at least you still head oh, New York City. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or like, I live in Redwood City and there's... Mm -hmm been like a total public art renaissance in the past yes, few months I feel like have. which is really fun yeah but I'm not sure I think there's like a nonprofit involved there mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering how the differences are how we compare how we compare uh, I'll, let, I'll let Elise handle that <laughs> <laughs> so um you know California in general is very um public art friendly and art forward so for instance the the public art and private development uh ordinance there are more than 50 of those in California alone. Mm -hmm. so, um, so California as a state really leads the charge. I think Palo Alto um, really reflects well on us. Um, we've, we've done a lot of growing and professionalizing in the last few years. I think we're in a great place. We're trying to grow wisely um, and anticipate that, yes, there are going to be fluctuations in the market. So we, we don't want to overextend. We don't want to overpromise, but we're... Um, but I feel really good about where we are right now, and that's why the master plan uh, couldn't have been done in a, in a more perfect time. Wisely and whimsically. <laughs> how, how, how Some whimsy. How, how, does, how does the explosion of kind of digital art and the city's images, like a big digital center, play into mm -hmm. the vision? Because mm -hmm. obviously the, the Narduli piece is highly visible, mm -hmm. but are you guys looking at uh, other kind of digital installations and digital media for, for future? Or is that still kind of an exception to the rule? Um, well, it, it does take a lot of work. New media artworks, by nature, they do. Um, so it's something we definitely look at. It, you have to find the right budget opportunity to be able to do it right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's certainly something we're wanting to explore. There's more of it throughout the field. Uh, so it's definitely a trend that's moving forward. We also have to be mindful of using funds wisely once again. Yeah. I mean, you know, the longevity of those yeah. pieces can be short, so we want to be mindful of that. Right now, our biggest symbol of digital art is an analog egg. 
Well, actually, be- before before the Narduli piece. Before Narduli. <laughs> Maybe someday it'll change. We'll see how it goes in the next 10 years as this plan comes to fruition. Yeah. Well, with, with that, I just want to thank Elise for joining us. Uh, it's been a great discussion. It's been fun. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, for more coverage of public art issues, please check us out at paloaltonline.com. Uh, thanks for joining us and see you next week.